So lately I've been reading about the fall of Roman Republic, and I stumbled into one of the chief architects of her downfall, a man who was one of the wealthiest people of all time, and known for his crucifixion of defeated slaves of Spartacus, his patronage of Gaius Julius Caesar, and his disastrous eastern campaign, a man called Marcus Licinius Crassus. Marcus was most likely born in 114 BC as the third son of Publius Licinius Crassus. Unfortunately, there isn't much information about Marcus's youth, but he was very close to his father. His father had risen to a position of consul, which was the highest and most prestigious political office in Roman Republic. Each year two consuls were chosen among the senators to basically lead Rome. New consuls would be voted six months before their terms so that they had the time to prepare their legislative agenda. Consuls had the power to summon the Senate and initiate and veto any legislation. Consuls would also be in charge of national security and were expected to assume command of Roman armies when needed. As the Senate was mostly led by previous and current consuls, being born into a consular family was an excellent way to pursue a senatorial career. Since Roman law dictated that every man should serve in the army, Rome had become very militaristic and military prowess was widely admired. For any man who would aspire to have a political career was required to have at least 10 years of military service. After Marcus's father's tenure as consul, he was assigned as the governor of Hispania. Hispania included many valuable resources, such as silver mines, which unfortunately for the Romans were controlled by the local tribes. And this was one of the main reasons why Marcus's father started a major campaign against the tribes. Marcus got his first military experience when his father took him to his military staff. During his four-year tenure, Marcus's father was able to defeat the tribes and was finally awarded with a triumph. A triumph was a great public spectacle and was awarded by the Senate to a general who had achieved great success in a foreign war. During a triumph, a general would parade through the streets of Rome with his soldiers and spoils of war. A general would be riding with a chariot wearing a lavish toga and sometimes he would paint his face red so that he would gain a near divine appearance. Few years later, in 91 BC, social war broke out between Rome and her Italian allies. Marcus's father was serving in this war as a legate, and young Marcus was once again serving in his father's staff. As was Marcus's oldest brother, who actually died during this war. After his death, Marcus took his widow, Tetula, as his wife, which was a common practice in ancient Rome. In Marcus's late twenties, this union produced two sons, and in a traditional Roman way, they were confusingly named Marcus Licinius Crassus and Publius Licinius Crassus. A common way for a young Roman aristocrat to establish his career in the Senate is to serve in the military in his late teens and twenties. In his thirties, he would assume his first political office. So far, we can see Marcus is following this pattern. He had participated in two major wars, which together lasted about six years. The next step for Marcus would have been to establish his political career, but that was not to be, since a great devastation would strike upon Marcus's family and to the whole of Rome, as the First Roman Civil War was about to start. The First Roman Civil War started from the dispute between two powerful men, Lucius Cornelius Sulla and Gaius Marius. Both men quarreled who would lead a campaign against the king of Pontus, Mithridates IV. Both men supported different political groups. Sulla was the leading member of the Optimates, who supported wealthy people and senatorial power. Marius, on the other hand, supported Populares, which was a faction which supported the cause of the common people. During this time, Sulla was a consul and was selected by the Senate to lead the campaign against Mithridates. However, Marius arranged to have a public assembly called, which elected him to lead the campaign. And of course, Sulla didn't accept this and fled from Rome to join his army, which was prepared for a campaign against Pontus. Sulla managed to convince these soldiers to do the unprecedented, to invade Italy. The Roman Republic had stood about 400 years since the last king of Rome was banished. Never before any Roman general had marched to Rome with an army, which was strictly forbidden by law and tradition. 
Marius hired gladiators to put up resistance, but they were no match against Sulla's professional soldiers. Marius had to flee from Rome and Sulla declared a death sentence on Marius. By marching to Rome, Sulla had set a dangerous precedent, which would inspire many ambitious generals in the future. Soon after Marius had fled the city, the Senate reconfirmed Sulla's command against Pontus, and Sulla soon left to lead the campaign against Mithridates. After Sulla had left, Marius followed Sulla's example and returned to Rome with his army and supporters, one of them being Lucius Cornelius Cinna. The city put up a major resistance, but it was finally overrun and chaos followed. Marius took his chance to remove some of Sulla's supporters, which included the family of Crassus. Marcus's father and older brother were among the many who were killed. The most likely reason why Marcus survived the slaughter was because his father planned his escape to Hispania in case the city would fall to Marius. Devastated, Marcus fled from Rome with three friends and ten slaves. He was now the only surviving son of his father and the head of his family. There's a story which tells about Marcus's rough situation after he left Rome. The story goes that he was forced to hide in a cave for eight months, where he was held by a stranger until he finally reached Hispania. Marcus remained in Hispania for over three years, waiting for the political situation in Rome to calm down. During this time, Sulla was still fighting Mithridates, Marius had died of natural causes, and Sina had been left in charge in Rome. Three years later, a word came from the east that Sulla had gained numerous victories and was about to successfully complete his campaign. It was expected that if Sulla would win, he would march on Rome and revenge the slaughter of his supporters. Sina had been preparing for this and gathered troops in Italy. However, Sina died by mutinous troops, which created chaos in Rome. Seeing this as a chance for power and revenge against the populares, Marcus decided to throw his full support for Sulla and raise over two and a half thousand soldiers for his cause, effectively proclaiming himself as a general. Most of the soldiers were veterans who had settled in Hispania and fought for his father. Raising the troops was illegal, as Marcus didn't have permission from the Senate to do so. This shows how chaotic and lawless Rome was during this time. And thus Marcus, as a young man, was now involved in a major Roman civil war, which would determine the faith of his family. Marcus paid his soldiers by extorting his neighboring Hispanic cities, and he was also accused of sacking a city of Malacca. With the acquired wealth, Marcus was able to purchase transportation ships and decided to transport his men to northern Africa, where one of Sulla's lieutenants was raising his own army. When Marcus arrived in Africa, he soon quarreled with the leadership there and promptly decided to leave to join his forces with Sulla directly. Sulla had completed his eastern campaign and had arrived to Greece. Marcus arrived in Greece and met Sulla, who didn't mind the fact that Marcus had self-proclaimed himself a general and raised troops without the consent of the Senate. In addition of bringing a sizable force to fight for Sulla, Marcus also provided the support of a consular family, which sent a strong political message. Therefore, Sulla made Marcus one of his lieutenants, and Marcus would remain at Sulla's side in 83 BC, when he would invade Rome. When Sulla arrived in Italy, he ordered Marcus with raising fresh troops, which he did in praising manner. In 82 BC, Marcus was successfully campaigning in northern Italy, alongside with another Sulla's lieutenants, Pompey Magnus. They laid siege to a city of Tuder and defeated a prominent Roman general, Carinas. It was later that year when the decisive battle would take place, which would determine the outcome of the war and the faith of Marcus. The battle would be known as the Battle of Colline Gate. At the Battle of Colline Gate, Sulla commanded the center of the army and ordered Marcus to be in charge of the right wing. As the battle progressed, Sulla's center and left wing began to crumble, and it was at this moment when Marcus stood up and was able to strike a decisive blow from the right wing, which gave much needed time for Sulla's army to recover and make a counter-strike. Battle lasted through the night and resulted to a Sulan victory. The battle had claimed a death toll of 50,000 men. In this battle, Marcus showed he had great martial skills and leadership. Marcus had raised an army from scratch and transported it from Hispania to Africa and from there to Greece. 
and he had fought against the best Roman generals at that time and won. Marcus had finally made a name for himself, but events were about to be unfolded which would tarnish his reputation forever. After Sulla had won the war, his authority in Rome was unquestionable. He went after the Tribune of the Plebs, which was a radical political office, which technically had unlimited legislation rights, and was the only office open to the common people. A tribune could initiate and veto any legislation in the Senate, and he had the power to convene a public assembly, which could pass laws, elect magistrates, and try judicial cases. So basically it could be used to undermine the Senate, like when Marius used it to take the campaign against Pontus from Sulla. Seeing the office as a threat to his power, Sulla stripped the office from its previously mentioned powers. Sulla also started to purge Rome from his enemies, which would be known as proscriptions. This involved a public list of names of who should be killed, with the killer receiving a reward after the deed. The dead man's possessions were to be confiscated by the state. Sulla decided to deploy Marcus to execute this bloody task. Marcus fulfilled Sulla's orders and purchased the confiscated property on a very low price. It's also likely he added to the list of names of men whose properties he had his eye on, and it's also accused he even courted a Vestal virgin to get to her property. As a result, Marcus now owned a vast amount of property, ranging from silver mines in Hispania to massive landed estates and prominent houses in Rome. By these actions, Marcus had made himself exceedingly rich, but at the cost of appearing greedy. Sulla was not happy about Marcus's actions, and the two became estranged. As hundreds of senators were now dead, Sulla decided to replenish the Senate by creating 450 new senators, many of whom usually didn't have houses in Rome. Marcus, unsurprisingly, was more than willing to provide for these men. Not only Marcus would get a large profit by doing this, he would also get the gratitude of many senators in the process, which is invaluable in politics. Despite Marcus had a falling out with Sulla, he was still elected as one of the new senators as his family name and rank demanded it. In 79 BC, Sulla decided to retire to his villa to be with his family and write his memoirs, thus leaving the day-to-day politics of Rome. Entering post-Sullan period, Marcus was at his mid-thirties and had risen to a major figure in Rome. He had shown his excellency in military skills, both tactically and logistically. He had raised a loyal army from scratch and transported it across the war-torn Rome. He was one of the first who defected to Sulla's cause and went with him to invade Italy, establishing himself a very good field commander in the process. Technically, he was still a junior senator, but he had an enviable military reputation, growing circle of patronage and great personal wealth. On the downside, he had been labelled as greedy and ruthless, but nevertheless he had laid the foundations of a promising senatorial career. Join us next time and see how Marcus rises to glory and becomes a hero of the Republic. Thank you for watching. Likes and comments are appreciated.